What is good, everyone? Welcome back to the Exhaust Notes Formula One podcast. My name is Nick Ingvall. I'm with my guys, Rowett and Todd, to talk about F1. But more specifically, I want to talk about... I don't even know where to start, to be honest. I, I want to just start with Checo. I feel like Checo should have had... This? I was what? just going to say, let's talk about Checo for the first three minutes of this podcast because that symbolizes the three minutes he was in the race, and then we don't talk about That's him fair. for the rest of the episode. That's fair. I feel so bad for that guy. Honestly, I should have just stopped there because I'll rant for way more than three minutes. So how are you guys doing? How do you feel about Checo? Is he ever going to be able to drive in a Formula One car after this season? I think you will. I mean, Alonzo has given us a precedence now that, hey, I'm going to retire, which means I'm just going to take a couple of years off and then try to buy my way onto a promising young team. But the thing I was thinking about is the likes of a Williams. What is stopping Williams from saying, hey, you know what? See you later, Logan Private. Come on down, Checo. But Williams doesn't have a bag for Checo, I don't think. But I thought that was the whole thing with Checo was he never really needed the bag because he had Carlos Slim's money serving as a bag as for him because he brings in all this sponsorship money and all this visibility. Yeah, I mean, maybe, but I'd see him going to like a Sauber or a Alpha or, you know, I guess Alpha is Sauber, but some like Haas, middle, yeah, Haas, something like that. Try to get the whole Tex Mex connection, something like that. But like, yeah, I just cool. could never see him go into the Williams. Plus, they just signed your boy Logie Sarge to twenty twenty four. They did. Because he fumbled his way into points. So, uh, is this the Peter Principle going? Is he the American <laughs> Latifi, or is he the American <laughs> Mazepin? I'll defer to you, Todd Yates. Well. I mean, if you trade out a uh, grocery supply store for, uh, what is it, like oil manufacturing or something, they're basically the same. One and the same. And this is also a metaphor because look at that. We thought we were going to talk about Checo for 30 seconds and we already <laughs> transitioned on. No, we're still talking Checo because holy hell, did he send one at the Mexican GP? That was I, – I actually saw the – Mercedes reserve driver try to say that was partly Max's fault. Okay. Thank you. Talk and about he, it. So he's a Mexican. He, uh, what's his name? Um, it's not Fittipaldi, is it? No, <laughs> no, it was Esteban Gutierrez. Another SD bestie. Uh, who's like a Mercedes reserve driver saying it was like partly Max's fault. Cause he's so aggressive, but really, he just sent one on the outside of three cars wide on like a really tight turn and turned in bef- while there were still two cars there. What at his home race, it's, it was the epitome of a desperation move. Can we at least be consistent in that? Like that's a move he does not make <laughs> if his seat is safe and he's done well this year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. maybe. Because it, it's your home race. You want to you show out for the family. Look, you might send it a little bit harder than other places. But when I looked at that back, okay, before I before I rant a little bit, I know Aaron's going to hate hearing this. Shout out to Aaron. If you've listened to the podcast, you know he's been on, member of the Discord community, shameless plug. Um, as a Max fan, he's going to hate my, my, my thoughts on this. But I think the interesting thing about the that first corner and all of what happened was basically Checo taking responsibility for it, which I thought was super dope. It was kind of like Lewis the week before, right? Or two weeks before, whatever it was. Like they both just way too hard, you know, like out of, not out of control, but just like pushing the limits too much. The one thing I will say about the, the Max idea, if you look at the cars, like if you look at the actual lines that they're taking, Max is definitely way wider than I would have thought he would have taken not that not the check not that it would have really changed a whole lot about Checo's situation because obviously Leclerc is not going to risk his car in order to give Checo room but 
when you look at it, I would love to see somebody look at that corner and see where where Max's line is on that corner every time because it seemed like he pushed way out, which is also him being first into the corner is his his kind of right. But it did seem to me that he was he was a little bit further out from the corner than I would have expected. And I didn't see anybody bring that up on social on the race day. So I'm glad you brought it up, Todd. (laughs) You didn't see that people were trying to compare that crash saying Max missed his corner to the Silverstone crash where Max hit the wall going like, Oh no, I didn't see that. Yeah. Okay. So you remember that not to bring up, might as well bring up Abu Dhabi 21 at this point, but Remember Silverstone when Lewis tried to go send one down the inside and miss the apex yeah. by like a car's width. And then everyone was like crucifying Lewis saying, well, everyone that doesn't <laughs> yeah. like Lewis, whatever was crucifying Lewis for saying he missed the corner. He, he like understeered whatever into max. That's what basically happened. But they were comparing that crash to the Mexico crash because max had, not say like a car's width on the inside, but he missed the apex, quote unquote. And there were everyone that's like a Lewis stand was like freaking out saying like, oh, it's OK when Max does it, blah, blah, blah. But like that yeah. has nothing to do with it. Like Sergio sent one around the outside of two other cars, pinched Leclerc, turned in before the corner even yep. started. What did he think? I mean, I, and I think he took responsibility for it. Thanks. You know. Phil Leclerc's got to be thankful for that because he would have had death threats had had Checo blamed him for that. I'm sure he did. But actually, Lewis took pointed the finger at Checo. Yeah, that was in the after good. race. Did you hear that in the cool down no, room? You know, he was like, oh, he saw the crash on the replays in the cool down yeah. room. And he's like, oh, that was like me in Qatar. Like <laughs> He like called yeah. out Jack. I didn't. The I, 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 I wasn't on was Twitter funny. for the race at all. So I guess that's like I saw some stuff on Instagram. I saw some stuff on threads, but I I'm trying to avoid Twitter and it's chaos. That how's that going for you? Because I struggle with that. It's, it's definitely the, the hardest platform for me to let go no because it is by far the like platform that I embrace the most from very you know like 2008 or whatever it was when it started mm-hmm. and. I actually have like yep. probably a dozen friends from that early days of Twitter that like became real life friends. It's like such a different a different time and, and place, but so- and and how many of them are members of Team LH? Uh, there's probably a few of them, definitely. But that's right. I don't know. If they, I don't know if they're the LH. new Team LH. They're they're the, they're the. Uh, Okay. Yeah, I, it's hard to distinguish when the when the shift changed, but uh, I did I I did want to bring up. It was pretty funny to hear. I think you you said something about it, Todd. But uh, George Russell basically saying it was like Abu Dhabi and or, it, and or what do you say it was Lewis's eighth title. Like I was like like bringing it up again. Oh, Here we go. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. It never ends. Like literally after every race, somehow yep. Abu Dhabi 21 gets brought up and it blows my mind. But like, I'm glad that I wasn't early Twitter Why is that? because like I can just I'm like that with Instagram, I guess, because I had it from like the start, basically. But like, I've definitely become more involved over the years on tw- not involved, but lurk more on Twitter because of F1. Yeah. Because, like, F1 Twitter is chaos. It's just, like, the darkest place on the internet. Like, everybody says that about whatever they're into, right? Like, NBA Twitter or... <laughs> yeah. Back is what, the basket right. weaving. Yeah, it could be any kind of, like, hobby thing. But yeah. F1 Twitter is full of psychopaths. And the two worst are yeah. the Max Stans and Team LH. I mean, you get the same kind of thing with basically anything, it, like especially sports, right? Like basketball, when there's like Lakers, Lakers Clippers stuff is horrible. Like I have friends on both sides of that, and it's just like my, my condolences it's as a Kings so fan. So evil. <laughs> Honestly, like it's the one thing that I feel like we're kind of we're kind of been able to just sidestep all of that, like real true crazy negativity. I mean, 
there's obviously a lot of uh, a lot of Lakers King stuff and a lot of obviously a ton of Kings Warriors stuff now. But um, I was gonna say, speak, I will say, yeah, go ahead. Threads is is like taking some of that. I feel like it's a I feel like it's like sort of like the nicotine patch that doesn't quite work, but it feels good right now. So if you if you want to give that, a shot, give that a shot, but speaking of kings and uh what else were we talking about well awkward side aside do you, do we want to talk about team lh's lewis hamilton and how he reacted to the second place because that was something you brought up in the pregame todd that you were pleasantly surprised about or was that you nick no i think i think it was me but like i don't know if it was just me it caught me at the right moment or whatever but i feel like mm-hmm. legitimately this last race was the first time since mercedes hasn't been top dog that like Lewis was genuinely pumped on a P2. Like he always is like, you know, in the post-race radio when they're like, oh, P2 Lewis, good job. And he's just like, oh, you know, let's go get him. Let's keep fighting. I felt like he was actually stoked, especially in the cool down room. He was like, like legit juiced mm-hmm. on getting P2 to like behind Max. Was that just me? I don't no. think. Yeah, go ahead, Nick. I think you're, I think you're spot on. Like it, it, he was, he seemed like genuinely happy at the end of the race too. Like, in a, I mean, he's always kind of happy, but like, it's always like with that, that, you know, we'll get him next time. Kind of happy. Right. And this time was like, yeah, it felt way different. I think it actually, well, go ahead, row it. I think I have some thoughts on this, but. No, I'll give you my time because, I mean, to me, I'm wondering, is he happy the fact that – is he sensing that a victory is near? Is he happy that this may be the last poignant result he has because we're ushering in almost a new era now? Because lo and behold, Lando's also getting podiums now as we were expecting him to get them at the start of the year. And maybe there's a body swapping incident with him and Fernando Alonso because this McLaren team, where has this team been? Because if they were like this at the start of the year, I think they might have been the team that gave Red Bull the most trouble. I mean, I would have thought, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Cause like, I think, I think Lando, the pace of Lando and Piastri, to be honest, is why Lewis was so happy with second, you know, like even though he's been on the podium a handful of times or a lot of times this year, it's never really felt like, like he had a good drive. It felt like other people made more mistakes to get him there in a sense. Okay. Um, and I think with like going into these races, part of it is probably, you know, you've kind of, you've kind of let down your guard a little bit because you, because you know, you're not racing max, you're not racing Red Bull and Mm -hmm. knowing that, you know, Lando and and Piastri are, you know, a few cars behind, it's got to feel pretty good, but also like, you know, I think, I think it's just a a mindset shift to like focus on or, or just remove the focus of focusing on max. Right. Like that's, that's also why I think it's always weird that people bring up, especially people from Mercedes. It's like, do you think Lewis wants to think about Abu Dhabi in 21? Like why bring that shit up? He doesn't have to think about it. They're going to trot any opportunity to bust out that beautiful bean footage. Yeah. (laughs) I feel like everybody that's the this sounds weird to say but that's the biggest thing that's ever happened in F1 so I don't think we'll ever oh yeah live it live it down like there's other sports with other moments like that right because that was like almost like peak drive to survive interest pandemic everything was like right for that moment like I feel like the whole world Almost watched that. Thirty-three billion new fans, as Bro used to used to say. <laughs> I still say it. Well, and if you look at historically for Formula One, right, you have plenty of rivalries. Mm-hmm. You've got like you know, I mean, we could go through them. But if you think about the most prominent of all mm-hmm. of those that are that you would even consider putting in this conversation, because like you're not really going to put, I don't know, Young Vettel at Red Bull anywhere in that conversation. You're not going to put Rosberg and Hamilton in that because it was short lived compared to Lewis and Max. Like we're really looking at like a handful of years, what four years ish, where it was literally just Lewis and Max that we knew were 
like one of the two was going to end up winning and like yeah other people got wins in there but like if you think about like prost, prost and senna to mm -hmm. me that's like the pinnacle of competitiveness in anything i mean it's it's probably the closest thing to uh, a magic versus bird or something like that and even to this day like when you see alain Pro Al alan alan Elaine Prost. Elaine Prost. Elaine Prost. When you see him do interviews, like he still has like serious energy around it. You know, like I mean, he's older and he's let it go, let, let go of a lot of it, but certain things still get under his skin when when Senna is brought up, and it's such a weird thing to me because you know he, that's the only thing I can think of that could potentially be compared to the Lewis mm -hmm. and Max thing because these guys, I mean, especially with Max. Mm -hmm going forward right like he has everything to prove still so like no matter how much he continues to win and dominate it's it's going to be well you don't have eight titles or you don't have you know whatever it is like he's going to be con constantly compared to lewis and whoever else previously and i think it's just yeah it's just kind of a sh it's it's funny when you're not like serious about it i guess but it's kind of shitty if everybody's just like well, constantly bringing it up, you know, like imagine if we were watching, you know, I don't know, baseball. And like every time somebody didn't, every time the Red Sox didn't win, we bring up Bill Buckner having a ground ball go through his legs. It's like, no, what the hell? it's exactly that, Nick. It's, it's the rare sport where the closest thing we've had to a Michael Jordan figure or a LeBron James figure is also simultaneously Bill Buckner. Because he's on the wrong end of history. He's uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand. He's the one that got shot. And it ushered in a brand new era. We have a new way of thinking. It's an inflection point. It's the tipping point. It's all the points, except for the point that Lewis needed to win that season. But that's one of those other aspects that if, let's say, the roles had reversed, are we seeing this Max Verstappen-like dominance? Probably not. Because you need these moments to usher in this new era, and you need the ability to seize the conch, so to speak, in the Lord of the Flies terminology. Yeah, I 100% agree. I mean, I think, like, that's... It's it's kind of like the, uh, you know, there's... The, I know we're getting a little off Formula One, but there's that... Off track? There's that story, and yeah, <laughs> off track. There's that story of, of Michael Jordan and Isaiah Thomas at the all-star game. And like, basically Isaiah Thomas just completely shitting on him as a rookie or second year or whatever. And like, not, you know, not passing in the ball, all that stuff. Right. And like, I feel like that's, that's like the epitome of like, just. And MJ took it personally. Yeah, Like it's, it's shitty, but you take it personally. And then now you're motivated. Now, you know, I've got to go to the next level to get to that point where I never have to feel that way again. And right. Max has obviously done that, you know, like losing so many times to Lewis just made him a complete animal on the track, you know, like props to him for figuring that out. Yep. I have one thought. Okay. Tangent again. Go ahead. You, so you're saying, Ro, you kind of called this the, as the inflection point for the passing of the torch there. You think if Lewis had won his eighth instead of Max winning his first, that the next year wouldn't have happened, like the zero pod dilemma, Merck having a terrible car. Like you still think the Mercedes would have come out on top or have been closer if they didn't? I think it would have been closer, but I also think that it's one of those things that what's our lasting image post Abu Dhabi 2021, right? It's our man, Total Wolf, in the black turtleneck saying, I'm coming for everybody. <laughs> and then in what was arguably the lamest title, it's not even a title defense, a title challenge that I can ever think of a quote-unquote contender. And if I'm Max Verstappen, I'm like, really? You made this whole <laughs> media campaign thinking mm -hmm. that you were going to intimidate me? And in actuality, I'm the intimidator, RIP to Dale Earnhardt Jr. Senior. It's silly. Senior. Right, Senior. Well, I killed somebody. That's great. Yeah. Yep. Dale Jr. still with us. Is he though? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it is one of those things that like, I know anytime we have these sliding door moments, the rationale is, well, if one thing happened that didn't happen, then everything else is going to occur accordingly. 
No, I still think probably Verstappen's closer to winning a his would that have been his first title than Lewis was his ninth because they were on the ascendancy. Like I think if we go take ourselves back to that moment in 2021, part of what was making that dynamic so intriguing was the fact that for the first time in a long time somebody was actually staying wheel to wheel with Hamilton. And that was something that previously was unheard of. But you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. Well, yeah. Yeah, 2014, 15. Yeah. 2012 or, yeah, whatever. That also, like wait, thir- 13. When, Six, right? when Rose, Rosenberg yeah. or God, Dag Nabbit. Rosberg. Thank you. Um, When did 12? Vettel win his last? 2012 or 13? And then 13. Is Rosberg. The Turbo yeah. Hybrid Era started. No, 16 was Rosberg versus Hamilton. When Rasberg won, but I do, I do, I do, I do agree with you on you that. Bro. I think that that those moments are are really like much bigger shifts than we realize, and it's it's Please. the the thing that sucks about. I don't want to go down this rabbit hole too far, but the thing Please. that sucks about it is like no matter what sport you watch, if you're a passionate fan of any sport, most people win or lose would rather the referees, the officials you know, whomever, not be involved in deciding the game. Like, yes, there's going to be shit calls. There's going to be great calls. There's going to be things that are for you. There are going to be things that are against you. But like just to have somebody determine the end of a race, a season, a, a, you know, a basketball game, whatever it is really the shitty part. But I, I think like that shift does change a lot more than, you know, like, Think about just like <laughs> this might be a little, a little too. Uh, I don't know what you call a, what you call it, but like just the energy in the team, both teams, right? From where you go from the end of a season for that, let's say three months or whatever you have off, two months you have off. Thinking about how you lost it versus thinking about how you won it, both of those things send you in a completely different trajectory. And to me, that's like, you know, you can't even really put a number on that to quantify what that actually means for a lot of people, especially someone who, like Max, who hadn't won a title before and won a title. Like, now you know you can do it. Like, think of all the things that we've done in our lives that, that like, we didn't know we could do. And then the moment you finally do it the first time, it's like, all downhill from there like everything is easy at that point because you've already proven to yourself and you're you're the person that you need to prove it to the most in order to believe it so yeah i have a personal theory that you need to hit rock bottom before you achieve whatever it is you're trying to achieve and it can be applied to sports it can be applied to life right i'm a kansas city chiefs fan rock bottom for me was d4 jumping off sides and then Subsequently, the very next playoff game, I believe the Chiefs had a 21 point lead that they were down within the first quarter. And I was like, "Okay, here we go again. But then you need these larger than life moments that go in the face of your own personal history or your own personal mythology. To your point, Nick, that almost shocks you into competency and competency. Ironically, I couldn't say that. So there you go. This is rock bottom for me here. But (laughs) that being said, I even look at it from the perspective of the psychology of things. Let's say in our hypothetical what if scenario, if we dive, uh, dive a little bit deeper, what's to say that if Lewis wins that race and wins his eighth title, then why isn't the win uh, knocked out completely from Red Bull sales? And then they get to the point now where they will never win another title because they clearly feel that, hey, we gave him our best shot. and He still won. There's something debilitating about that psychologically. And then conversely, I could see the same scenario in the sense that, let's say, life happened the way it did happen, where Max won his first title there. How much of Mercedes attempts at building a car next year was fueled by hubris of they got lucky we're going to come back because i can bet you one black turtleneck that's what was happening in that garage and lo and behold they still haven't won anything substantial since that moment and we're almost going into a second straight year of lewis hamilton not winning a race which would be unfathomable if you told us that at the start of the 2022 season yeah that's wild he hasn't actually won a race since yep which is another sliding doors moment. Like that is absurd because we were talking about him as the best ever. And now the way Max has been dominating the last three years, really I'd say two years because that first 
championship is a coin flip ultimately, which is the theme of this episode. We're now talking about Max in the same way we're talking about Lewis in terms of he might be the greatest when it's all said and done. Does he want to go and actually challenge for all these other records? Because isn't he going to tie Vettel's record for most wins? And granted, he's got more races in a season than Vettel ever had, so maybe he gets disqualified for that. But this is pretty dominant. He actually just yeah, he's already got it, right? Record. He broke it. Yeah. He broke yeah, his this own is the second time he's broke year. it. Yep. Yeah. So I I have two two things that I want to say about that. One is we need to do an episode and I'm I'm encouraging anybody listening to send us ideas, hot takes for this. We need to do an episode strictly around leveling the field in Formula 1. I think there's a lot of ways we could change rules and do some interesting things to actually make it it's been really competitive in the midfield, but like, I mean, like bunch right. everyone up the way that like the way that Netflix dreams of Formula One being raced. I don't want to get into that on this episode, but I want to put it in your guys' ears so you can think about it for a future episode. The other thing I want to I want to pivot slash springboard off of this conversation. Lando Norris passing 8000 cars in Mexico in order to get what third, fourth, what did he finish fourth? I'll look it I up. Mean, you guys keep chatting. That is the type of drive that is is the same kind of thing that we're talking about in like a shift in energy. When you realize that you can literally pass the same car, the same 12 or 15 cars twice in a race, I would not be surprised if if Lando actually comes out and gets a win in the next couple of races based on that. I'll, I'll defer to senior, or I guess junior Lando expert, because Engvall's senior uh, Lando <laughs> expert. But you know what I was thinking of? It's the moment in the Matrix where like they're all just looking at the green screen and they're like, oh, he's dodging bullets. And Morpheus turns to somebody and says, when he's this good, he doesn't need to dodge bullets. He can just stop them in their tracks. Like That's what I think Lando is experiencing in that moment. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a good way. Of I, I don't it. know if he's there yet, right? Like That was probably the best drive he's ever had, including the almost win that he had i would say uh as far as like pure pace and overtaking and his racecraft like i think that's probably his best drive ever he got fifth uh i also thought he got fourth for some reason but the lowly ferraris were ahead of him how dare you um the thing with me is that i kept thinking about lando or just mclaren in general I feel like one, they finally have figured out their car, their development. When like Zach start said at the beginning of the year that they, like, they just built a shit box and they're gonna like kind of scrap it and have a new, like, B spec car halfway through the year. Um, but I also kind of get the feeling, just from everything I read on the team and every what you know what the team is saying in interviews and stuff that like they have peaked with that car. And I don't know if I finally feel like in these last couple of races that Red Bull is driving 10 tenths. And even then, I don't know if they've really had to like go flat out for a whole race and get, give like their ultimate pace. Like Max in what in the USA, he had that brake issue. So he was kind of managing in Qatar. No he shit. was, mm -hmm. Wait, who won Qatar? Is that signs? I'll look it up. Um, but like, I still don't feel like Red Bull has given a hundred percent of that or shown a hundred percent of their pace yet. And I feel like McLaren, even with their most recent upgrades, which are all working, which is fantastic news for me being a Papaya fan. Like I feel like they're at a hundred, hundred percent, and that that might have been Lando driving at a hundred and five percent to yes. to to do what he did, go from P seventeen to P five. The, the aforementioned Qatari GP had Max Wells in first place, but yes, you're, that was T Papaya showing out, so to speak, because that was the race that Pia, Piastri had second and Lando had third. Uh, okay, okay, and shouts to Oscar for knowing he didn't have the pace or listening to team orders or whatever you want to call it, because he let Lando through pretty, pretty easily, pretty quickly. And that made the difference for Lando getting like, you know, P eight to P five. So like, nice to see teamwork there. 
Damn. So I guess let me ask you this, Nick. You kind of alluded to it earlier. Are we thinking Lando is going to win a race in the last... How many races do we have left in the season? We have two Two or three. There's rumor that Abu Dhabi will get potentially get canceled. Uh, Yeah, Middle East stuff happening. Because Abu Dhabi is Abu Dhabi, and I will say no more on the subject. Um, (laughs) You don't want to get Brazil this weekend. Vegas two weeks, (laughs) I think, or one week, I guess. Brazil's this week. I thought Brazil's Brazil's this this week, and then Las Vegas is two weeks. Two weeks back to Vegas, and then two weeks again to. To Abu Dhabi, I mean, think, I think. so. It's an interesting point that you make, Todd, about if the car is is tapped out. Because um, Lando has finished second four of the last six races, so like obviously he is the other car to beat in the field. The, the you know, with these last two or three races that we have left. If the car, I mean, it's hard for me to imagine that the car is maxed out, like. But I, I do kind of agree. Like, I feel like Red Bull's been sandbagging the whole year. <laughs> like, I mean, I, the the wildest stuff to me when when I think about Red Bull and how dominant they've been, and obviously Max, you know, Checo's all over the place mentally. So it's, it hasn't he hasn't you know put the car on on the pace that he could. Um, it's wild to me that they don't. Like I forget what races, but recently, like the last few races, people have have like stole the fastest lap, you know, point. Yeah. Yuki had one. Yeah, Yuki had one. one. And and I just like that to me like makes me think like they already they kind of are just like ah, we don't care about it. I mean, they don't really need they haven't needed to worry about points for, you know, five races, right? It's been at least four or five since they clinched constructor and both. yeah, both of them the same race, right? So, well, no, it was one week yeah. later, I think. No, because it was that weird Japan sprint. Oh, that's right, Max the got yep. the, the 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 title and awkwardly <laughs> was presented the drivers' championship. Yeah, I don't know. I I I, I I'm hoping I'm wrong. But like that's how it feels still. And then maybe just because like you just said, it feels like Red Bull's been sandbagging the entire year. So maybe it feels like, oh, they still have tricks up their sleeves. And like that, there was recent talk, I think in the last race, mm-hmm. Christian Horner said, Oh, like we kind of stopped developing yeah. our car, even with our like reduced penalty wind tunnel time. <laughs> like we kind of stopped developing our car mm-hmm. like in April or something. And we're working on next year's car, which is scary as hell. If they were already yeah. that fast, right? So that, I don't know. That's why I kind it's of also, like that it's also it's also just the, the the mind games of Formula One. So you never really know. It's like the uh, I forget who brought it up, but Lewis is always like, I don't know if these tires are going to last. And then you know, like just it, it's a sandbagging yeah. league, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. My tires yeah. are gone. Yep, fastest yeah. lap. No, but I mean, like, that seems to be as much of the pedigree of this sport than anything, which is you're always downplaying yourself because you don't know who's got what. And it's constantly a poker match as well as a actual auto race. But just for once, I want the self-aware driver to be like, you know what, guys, we're going for mid table this year. We'll see you hopefully. Well, well, we did get one instance. (laughs) We didn't talk about this pre-show, but we did get one instance of driver basically showing his cards was it Pierre Gasly was like basically say tell us I'm coming for her, whoever it was that was in front of him did you see that first of all sir it was <laughs> yeah. my SD bestie yeah. and he was telling Nico Hulkenberg like I'm coming for you and then I was just like he must have thought he was every generic 1980s action hero that's delivered hasta la vista and then when the actual execution of it came and we're like okay this dude's more Danny DeVito and twins than anything <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that, but that's very much yeah. Literally, like literally said, time. "Tell him I'm, tell him I'm coming, I'm coming for him." The like this next lap or something like that. 
he might be the most or rather the least intimidating driver on the grid. So I feel for you, Hulkenberg. I really do. You're never gonna podium and you got got by the Esta Bandit. I, I, I think George Russell is like well, slightly like, less uh, intimidating. He just comes I mean, other than like I know he's racing? a really good driver, but like he comes across as just like this overly polite guy all the time. He's yeah. every bad stereotype of British people there is, like kind of pompous, stickler for the rules, always complaining about the underhanded members of society. <laughs> to his credit, though, like he got called out for that this year. Like George Russell's the type of guy who or whatever. Yeah. And he, he leaned into it, Maybe. which like yeah. I appreciate. He, I think he's self-aware to know that he is yeah. like kind of a tight. He's know, a hall monitor. Guy. Let's call yeah, him. He, he, yeah, he's I'll definitely a narc. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely a narc. He's definitely the friend you invited over for sleepover, where he's going to tell your mom, uh, "Do you know this is a rated R movie that you're allowing us to rent? Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's boobs in here, right? Yeah, not like a flare <laughs> shot. Yeah, it, it is, no, but, it is yeah. great that he leaned into it, though, because that's the that's the like as somebody who works in marketing all day every day, that's the one thing that frustrates me the most about Max. I think he's a great driver. I think he's actually probably potentially the best driver in a Formula One car ever, maybe. And I hate saying that because I am definitely not a fan of him like that. But the fact that he has such an arrogant, uh, like he just has such a persona uh, and he doesn't do anything with it to like market himself or play into it more. I just feel like it's such a missed opportunity. He he literally, you know who he reminds me of? He's an even less charismatic uh, version of Gold Member from the Austin Power movies, where he just thinks being Dutch is his entire personality. Yes, and it's not. Like you could be so much more. Like lean into your inner supervillain. I, yeah. I'll take a tangent there and say he is F one's equivalent of Mark Zuckerberg. Mm. Like, have you ever seen Zuck try to laugh in an interview? Uh, uh, yeah. And come- <laughs> It's like you can see the gears turning. Mac, I've said it a bunch of times, but he's like robotic in the sense that he only knows racing. And I've never met the guy, right? We haven't, you know, had a beer together or whatever. But like, even in like the promotional material that like uh, Red Bull does, I saw one recently. I want to say it was in Japan, but it was like Yuki, Max, or whatever. And they were in like K cars in some sort of stadium or whatever. And like Max was trying to be funny and like rocking the K car while Yuki was in it, but he just came off so awkward doing it. And like that is the epitome of Max. Is like to me, it's like he only knows racing. He, he's the kind of guy that's like shaking the K car, rocking the K car back and forth, but like the look on his face is like sending pure like fear through everyone around. Like, will he roll this car <laughs> over with Yuki in it? Will Yuki survive? Yeah. I think see yeah. here's like here's like the golden moment. If Max came out from a race and was just like t- his total arrogant self, and then flipped it to Rowett's point, gold member, you know, dropped the I'm only I, what is it? I'm from Holland, isn't that spiel? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was thinking he he says there's only two types of people in this world that I can't stand: people who are intolerant people of other yeah. people's whatever, and the Dutch. Uh, it's people who are intolerant of other people's culture and the bloody <laughs> yeah, Dutch. Exactly. You don't see the irony in that, but I feel like Max would say that it, would and be, it would just be he he would be too serious about it, so people yeah. wouldn't even know that he was like actually making a joke so, about it. Just... I'd love it for him to try to drop like a Ricky Bobby, <laughs> yeah, like after he wins a race, <laughs> and like see how awkward that came out. Absolutely. You know, I just woke up in the morning and I piss excellence, like. Yeah. That if he drops something like that after a dominating win, like he still won by 13, 14 yeah. seconds the last race, like just please do something like that. Like lean into like the arrogance, I agree, but like try to be fun with it. It, it would be like, I don't know, but that's that's too much to ask. That's just let him win his fourth, fifth, sixth title, whatever. 
But do you also think that this is, in a way, some sort of commentary on who his partner is this year? Because maybe if there was a more competitive driver, we would see that side of Max. Because even for somebody as him who's renowned for those outbursts that make grown men blush and cry based on the expletives that have been thrown out, he's been so docile the second half of the year as well because he really hasn't had anything else to race for. Because Checo's not pushing him. The rest of the grid isn't pushing him. Like, what is he to do? So that's a good, that's, I'm glad you brought that up because that's the one time where Max's like fun, funny personality comes out because he'll screw with Bono because he's bored and he's 20 seconds in the lead. Like Bono will be like, okay, like time to manage your pace, look after your tires or whatever. (laughs) And then Max, like his version of funny is like, he doesn't say anything. He just goes and does the fastest lap. All right. Like after, or not Bono, uh, GP. Yeah. Um, but we get the what you're saying, and it's, not in the breaking zone. I know we made the, yeah, we made the Kawhi Leonard thing. It's probably a little bit more Tim Duncan, especially in these Onion articles from like the past 25 years, where it's like Tim Duncan cocks his eyebrow unsurely as a nation watches in. <laughs> Like, that's who he is, which is great in a sense. But, yeah, I want to see a little bit more. But, I mean, this is Max at his evolved form. This is what we've said for the better part of this entirety of this show's existence is we've literally watched him mature into a ruthless cyborg cyborg of a driver. It's basically a data – it's just a data analysis that you're watching, right, where you're seeing everything move. And, like, like Max is at the top of the chart the entire time, and you see all these other things come up and fall off. You know, like, now it's Lando that's coming up. It was Alonzo at the beginning. To your point, nobody's given him any reason to actually drive harder. So, like, this is what we do as a pit stop for him. He has to physically get out of the car, go to the bathroom, then come back in the car. And then that constitutes a pit stop for him. Because I, even then, like, he could spend a minute in the pits and still make it to the podium because yeah. he's been that good. The car's been that great. Yep. I wonder if you started Max down a lap, if he would still win. Like it, there has to be one of the races this oh, year. Oh, definitely. There's been a, there's probably been a few that he had, he had that, that pace, kind of a gap. Well, yeah. maybe not a full lap. Well, like he, I feel like every race so far this season, if he started in P20, he's going to win, yeah. with, with the exception of Monaco, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. kudos to him. That's why he's going to get Red Bull. Hopefully, 800 points in my hot take and come true, and my genius is yet again on display. I want to go back to broken. Like, you know, emotionally broken people for a second, but it, it's on par for what we were talking about earlier. I saw a crazy stat after the race on Twitter that Max has now converted 16 oh. Charles Leclerc polls into yep. a victory. Yep. He's taken the win away from Charles 16 times when he's on pole. That's amazing. That's I probably would- my favorite Max for Zap. No, I was going to say, I wish there was a historical precedence that we could readily bring up to our listeners of what is the likelihood of you winning a race when you've qualified on pole? Because to your point, I saw the stat where this is the 11th race that Charles Leclerc has gotten pole and not won. And now you're telling me on top of that, Max has taken it away from him for the last 16 times he's won pole? That's such an amazing stat. Carlos is the better driver. I I never want to hear anything about... (laughs) Charles Leclerc again. To be fair, he's looked on on point the last few races. Ferrari has some pace back in the last couple. Nice but they to see. Still have the same strategy. Or I, lack thought, I thought this weekend was it. <laughs> this Mexico, the strategy was all right, right? Like they were a little off pace, but like the strategy was fine. It was fine. And then yeah, Charles got screwed on the on the USA, USA. Pit, on the pit stop strategy, right? Yeah. Because they tried to do one stop. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. But like the, the car the pace in the car is has been was really, you know, down, you know, yeah, fifth, sixth fastest car for a minute. Yep. Uh yeah. but it it was just nice to see Ferrari back up, but then I saw that that stat after the race and I was just like, holy hell, like talk about like He's probably get it flying under the radar right now because of the Checo drama and like all the rumors around what's happening there. But like, man, like if you're like the prodigal son of Ferrari and 
you've lost pole 16 times. It's like, I don't know how he has a smile on his face ever. Apparently, other than having a cool team on uh, in chess on a private jet, like that's the only thing I can explain. <laughs> well, he is like, yeah, flying on private jets all over the world, so I guess that would give you a smile. No, but I mean, at this point, can we do a quick evaluation? If you're Ferrari and you're at the start of the season, and we essentially hand you what you're going to do this year, would you take this season as a success, or would you consider this season a failure coming off of last year? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm. That's a really good question. I think this. I feel like we ask this question every year when it comes to them because it's equally the team with the highest of expectations, and then conversely, also the lowest of expectations. Yeah, I feel like it's a failure this year. I mean, mm-hmm. strictly just based off of my perception, not not statistically in any way, but my perception of the team this year is that they don't have their shit together. Even though last year they had a lot of problems, I at least felt like they were always potentially like a team that needed to be like that a team that could go out and beat Max or anybody else at the, at any given moment. Yep. I would actually go the other way. I feel like they finally have Okay, we we all acknowledge that their strategy is still shit and for the most part, right? They have their good days, whatever, but it's bad generally. Yep. They built a one more reliable and two pretty quick car, at least at the start of the year. And three, they have Fred Vasseur, which it feels like there's a little bit more stability in the garage or in their team mm-hmm. or whatever. Like he's handled like you know, he's handled the ups and downs better than Bonato or Harry Potter ever did. I feel like, so I don't know. I think I, it's still a failure, but a more positive failure, if that makes sense. That they're makes fa- sense. failing upward a little bit. I was just going to say this, this feels the quintessential take one step backward to take two steps forwards uh, season, because I do think there's a certain professionalism and a normalcy that, Fred Vassour has brought to this team that Benato did not, but I also think this team thrived better in chaos last year than they did this year, which tells me that they're actually heading to a place of actual competency, which is saying something for Ferrari. Because they, the rap on them has always been, they need something to kind of go haywire for them to, similar to what we were talking about earlier, take things in their own hand. Like I'll use the example of Carlos Sainz rejecting their strategy what feels like last year, maybe it was this year, and then taking that title or taking that race to the podium and getting first place. And that's Ferrari in a nutshell. They're going to make a suggestion and it's on the drivers to say, you know what? I'm good. I'll go ahead and just do my own thing. And more often than not, it tends to work out for the driver. That being said, Fred brought the normalcy that we thought he would, but they don't have the statistical backing to show for it. But I think they will be the team that gives Red Bull the most headaches, if we want to call a headache next year because I have high hopes for them because of the fact that Fred is an actual adult in the room and he's telling them to understand the adversity Todd, and learn from remind, it. Remind us how, like, are there a lot of changes coming for cars next year? Yeah, I heard of, it's yeah. the following year, right? No, year. not a ton. There's a little, little bit here and there. It's actually not until 20. Okay. Is it six? Uh, 26 is the big, the big change, but I'm going to try to give an analogy and you may or may not understand this, but I'm a huge uh, car nerd and Top Gear fan. And many, many years ago on an episode of Top Gear, Jeremy Clarkson was reviewing a Lamborghini, which is the Italian brethren to the Ferrari. And he talked about it. And it was shortly after Audi or Volkswagen Group had bought uh, had bought Lamborghini. So they mm-hmm. now own Lamborghini. And he said it's a all around better car but it's lacking like the Italian flair. Like it's doesn't have the lunacy yep. of, of what Lamborghini should be. And I feel like that's what Ferrari's team is now. Like Bonato had the Italian flair and the lunacy and on their best day, they could win. But now it's a little bit more steady, steady Eddie. And on their best day, they still might win, but it doesn't have the same like flair. Yeah. It does not. It does. If that That's a good way sense. to put it. It does. All right. I think we need to shift and talk about 
what we're not allowed to talk about if we were officially Formula One media, and that's Fernando Alonso's retirement. Oh, Nick, Nick please. Well, good, because I want to talk about Checo, and this all ties in together. Can you just throw the word allegedly in every sentence you're about allegedly. to spew? Because I'm Alleged not trying retirement. to get... I mean, so Allegedly. before b- before we get into Alonzo, like I did not hear the rumors of Aston Martin being sold. So any insight on that? No, I, I mean, I've just heard Scott about that unnamed Saudi Arabian princes are interested as is Aramco. Like that's the extent of the rumor that I've heard. Todd, anything else on your end? <laughs> Same. I heard the Aramco thing. Um, they are title sponsor or by at least one like co title sponsors of the Aston Martin team. Anyway, it's a Saudi oil money group. Basically. Um, is that like a Probably. venture capitalist yeah. firm over here? I don't know. What's the equivalent? Anyway. <laughs> um, Tread lightly. Um, and then lightly. <laughs> they, uh, you know, have been rumored to be in talks to purchase a larger stake of the team. Um, you know, Daddy Stroll might see the writing on the wall with his son. Um, I, I don't really actually believe that part of it, but it does seem to be that at the end of the day, he is a businessman, a b- 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 businessman. Um, that if he wanted to just go out and sell the team for a billion dollars, that he would try to. Uh, I don't know if F1 would actually allow that though, or Formula One management, whatever. That seems like if he even tried that they might block that because it feels, I don't know, feels like a little hand in the cookie jar-ish to have a title sponsor on the team kind of thing. But um, that was going on along at the same time that Checo has been, well, Checo has been shitting the bed for a while, but recently Mm -hmm. under lots more scrutiny, the media loves to play it up. Um, And that was coincided with uh, Alberto, Alberto for, for Braga, whatever his name is. He's a Spanish journalist has like all the inside scoops and stuff uh on twitter he's a great follow if you want to but you have to translate the tweets because i'm not fluent in spanish but he drops like a bombshell like a total, totally cryptic bs tweet like i just heard a rumor in the pad or rumor in the paddock that no i don't want to believe and that sent f1 twitter into a crazy everyone speculating and then will buxton like doubled down on it um and the the rumor mill was off and churning there, but that included everything from Danny Rick getting Checo's seat for next year to uh, Al- Alonso going to Red Bull and swapping places with Checo to Aston Martin selling to uh, the Saudis to Audi backing out and s- selling their portion to Andretti it's just all over the place but I know you wanted to talk about Fernando and Red Bull so well now I have now I have more questions though so going back head title also team owner isn't that just Red Bull well I guess so but like Red Bull their title sponsor now is Oracle yep so Red Uh, Bull owns the team but they're they're getting the bag from Oracle and gotcha. okay. I guess it's a little weird because Ineos owns yeah. a third, I think, Mercedes. of like the Mercedes team or something like that. So maybe I'm just, you know. So the, the interesting thing about Stroll is that he is executive chairman for Aston Martin, the car Road brand, cars, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so if he sold the team, would he... You know, like, I wonder how that impacts his, like, what his thought process would be for that. Does it impact his thought process at all? Or is he just like, it's Formula One, I do it for my kid. And if he's not racing, then I'm out kind of thing. And I just want to make some money off of it. Because obviously the, the, the team is worth way more now than what it was, yep. you know, five years ago or whatever. Yeah. 
I mean, I think it ultimately comes down to what does Lor- uh, Lance Stroll want to do? Because I could see Papa Stroll stay in the sport if Lance is still in love with racing. But if he's not, why not sell while the getting is good? And if nothing else, you can placate Lance by saying, why don't you become an owner of a Formula One team? Because he's got the money for it. <laughs> you mean Lance has the money? Well, Lance through Papa. Yeah, but... Oh man, I had never that thought had never even crossed my mind. Could you imagine Lance running or being the executive chairman of the Aston Martin F1 team and having like Fernando try to or having Lance try to tell Fernando what to do? Holy shit. Do we just cue the Benny Hill music now? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean the thing is they're the team that's most interesting to me because obviously we've all alluded to the fact that there's one gaping hole in the grid next year if everything is to be believed around Checo. But there's going to be significant domino activities that will happen as we fill that role. And whether it's Fernando, whether it's Danny Rick, whether it's even like the most absurd rumor I heard was Yuki would get that uh, Aston Martin seat that was vacated by Fernando. Oh, because which... oh, Honda is going to be their engine yep. supply. Yeah. But that's not until 26. So I don't think anything would happen. No, but I mean, like, it, well within your right to say that, Todd, but it's just one of those things that also kind of drives the sport when they're not actually driving on the track is the game of musical chairs. And there's literally a Photoshop for every rumor that can be put on Instagram within 30 seconds. And we're all going to buy it. And we're all going to talk about it the next episode until the even more salacious rumor happens. And then it's a vicious cycle. Yeah, I, I mean, among the whole rumor mill thing that I just talked about, the only thing and this is going back on. Uh, Alberto from Braga's tweet. Only thing that makes sense to me based on what's happened this season. Like, I don't see Lance or Lawrence Stroll selling the team. Sorry, I didn't use his proper name. Daddy Stroll. Uh, I don't see Daddy Stroll selling the team because they just built like a $400 million wind tunnel. They have all kinds of new technology going into their facility. They're investing huge into the team. They threw out the bag to a bunch of engineers and stuff from other teams, high profile names. But couldn't that sweeten the pot for somebody to potentially buy it? Because they're like, look at what we're giving you. I feel like that's a heavy. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I I feel like, like he's like wearing the big boy pants. Like he's serious about that five-year plan um, that Otmar started for him. What is that? (laughs) Two years ago now? Like, they started the car, like started the season. He'll look back and say, like, we started the season with the second fastest car, and it went downhill from there. So, what? How much money do I need to spend this year mm-hmm. to make that last longer or be even closer or whatever it is? Like, he already got his all star driver in Fernando. He's not letting that go. Um, and I think. Out of the whole rumor mill, the only thing that we have to worry about being any sort of true, which still probably like he's going to finish probably third in the driver's championship unless he has a couple of good races here to end the season and beats Lewis. Um, He's third in the driver's championship. Like he can't yeah. really shake a stick at that. Like granted, he's in the fastest car and there's no reason he shouldn't be second behind Max, but I just don't see any of the other stuff being even possible. Now, and, and like the fantasy fiction writer in me is also kind of thinking that if we go down the Danny Rick in the second role uh, for Red Bull, that tells me that they have grander ambitions than a Fernando Alonso, because my whole thought process is if it's Danny Rick, I think he's going to get a one year rolling contract until 2026 when the deck is essentially shuffled. And once you know it, I think that's when everybody's second favorite driver uh, Lando is up for a contact. And while I don't see him ever jumping ship to Red Bull, like I think that's what a lot of people have their hopes pinned on. But I I defer to you two because you two are big McLaren fans, you're big Lando fans. What is the point of view that somebody could take to justify him jumping ship? Because I don't see it at all. I don't I don't see him leaving. I mean McLaren McLaren's delivered a better car than they have his entire time there this year. So to me, like he'd be a fool to to jump ship now as they're getting their shit together. I mean, there's obviously enough history at that team for them to like be a very important part of formula one, you know, like whatever the next five to 10 years of formula one is 
Jeez. So I, I couldn't imagine him going anywhere. I was going to ask Todd, like I'm look, I was looking, you said Alonzo is going to finish third. No, sorry. Oh, okay. I meant to say Checo. I, if I said okay, Alonso, I meant yeah, to say Checo. That's where I was getting confused because I think Checo's second, Lewis is third, and Alonso and Sainz are tied for fourth right now with 183. And Lando's 14 yeah. points behind. So, like, Lando's probably going to be ahead of Alonso if Alonso if, if Alonso gets another shit car like he seems to have had the last, you know, couple months. Does he actually retire? Like, I mean, I don't see him retiring, no. but, like, He's not you can't really leave either. Aston Martin at this point, right? Like, there's no place for him to go that makes sense. No. Unless it's the Red Bull. Like, that's the only thing. That's why I think there is a little validity to these rumors. Because I think the other thing that we were kind of joking around in uncertain terms is the fact that Lando, or not Lando, sorry, Alonso threatened to take legal action mm-hmm. against people if they continue to perpetuate this rumor. Where anytime I hear something like that, that means we're a little closer to the truth than anybody would care to admit. Now, the question is, what exactly are we close to? Is it the fact that he's going to Red Bull or is it the fact that he's got his eye on another seat? But then again, where would he go? I mean, nowhere else. If he does go to Red Bull, I mean, I I love it. We spoke it into an (laughs) existence last episode. Like, we literally talked about this. Because he's not taking a back seat to Max, no matter how much he says he is. He's going out there to beat Max. Yeah, like, but like, go ahead. Tom. I don't think like we've talked about this before, but <clears throat> how we started the season and they had a quick car, and he was like, you know, talking up Lance when Lance would have like you know a, a good performance, or like he was so bored, he was like uh, on the jumbotron, he saw Lance make a pass and was like, oh, tell Lance that was a sweet pass. Like he is was started the year doing everything he could to like big up. Aston Martin and uh, Strolls, Lance, yeah, and the Strolls, whatever. There's no chance that he would be like that going into Red Bull. He would be up until the season starts and actually has a chance to fight Max. And then he'd say, yeah. I'm going out with a bang. I'm giving everything I can to beating Max this year. He, he is the classic big game hunter personality. And to your point, he's going to win the press conference yeah. where he's going to play his best Taylor Swift impression of me. I can't believe it either, guys. Like, I just want to push Max. And then when the rubber meets the road, that dude is going to come for him. And it is not going to be sweet. It's going to get petulant. And this is why we talked about this last episode. He is the one person on this grid that truly thinks he can take Max for stepping uh-huh. down, all things considered equal. Now I yeah. just want to see it happen. Yeah. Every other driver has various levels of doubts that they could kind of talk themselves in and out of that situation. Not Fernando. Alonso is thinking, I've got the measure of this man. I could take him out if you give me an equal pace car. And even if it's not equal pace, because if there's one thing Fernando Alonso loves more than himself, it's talking about points that he should have got. And that's what would happen. <laughs> so we have 2024 <laughs> Lando crowning or not Lando, Fernando crowning himself world champion because of the points he should have got. Yep. Oh, God. Yeah. I can only imagine. I mean, I wonder, like, I, I wonder... Yeah. I don't know. Like, I don't know what what Fernando thinks about his future in the sport, but there just can't always be a seat for him available, in my opinion. Like, is he a good driver still? Yes. Is he, yeah. you know, he's, he's, he's upper half of the grid. Uh, upper top quarter. I know, think all he's things a top equal. five driver. This, on you think points? so? I would put him as a top three driver. This not year. joking. Uh, not points, obviously, because he hasn't had the car to compete for the last third of the season. So top three drivers. So it's Max, mm-hmm. him and Lewis. Who you got, Engel? I'm talking like, and this is be a fun thing. I probably put Lando up there, top three. I might even put George above Alonso right now. Oh, see, I, I, like, the thing is, I'll, I'll concede Lando his car to issues. you. George is a paper tiger. If <laughs> Fernando gives him the illusion of something going wrong, you know George Russell. He's going to fixate on that. He's going to try to call the attention to the stewards, to his own team, and everybody's going to tell him to shut up and drive. And he's going to lose because of that. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, the The reason why I ask is because I feel like at at his age, and with this 
last few seasons where he's just bounced around from team to team. Like, what are you going to do after you stop driving? Like, we know you want to drive until you're 60 or 80 years old, whatever it is. But when are you going to just own a team? Because that's the, that to me is like the next evolution for any of these guys, right? I mean, Roeth brought it up for Lance Stroll. Like, it, there's nothing that, there's nothing really to say that that couldn't happen or, or isn't like actually a strong possibility at some point down the road. So if anything, if anybody on the grid should actually be owning a team outside of Lewis, I would say that it's Alonzo. You got to have the bankroll now. Like the, there's no such thing as like the gentleman driver team anymore. Like the only feasible situation where that happens is Lance Stroll because he's dead, daddy war bucks. Like Lewis owning part of Mercedes at the end of his career is feasible, but he wouldn't be like, I could never see him as a team principal owner. Like the last time there was a driver owner was Jackie Stewart in the 90s, I think, Stewart Racing. And that failed miserably. Like there's people that are good at being team principals or running a team or being an engineer. And then there's good drivers. I don't think you could add both. I don't, I don't think, I think like you would have to go about it in a, in a strategic way. Right. I think Lewis is going to own Mercedes or his own team at some point because he's probably got, he's probably been given options or, or shares of the team in negotiating. I think that's like probably common. And I think that someone like Alonzo has the pull to, to like bring other talent to a team. It's kind of like, it's, it's, it's a part of the same conversation we had last episode where like you get these like famous people, they're not going to own a team outright necessarily, but like, you know, LeBron James is going to own a basketball team through and through by the time he's done. Michael Jordan already did. And was like, to your point, Todd was like, nah, this isn't for me. Like, let me sell off the, the Hornets. If I can't make them win. I think like, in Formula One, there's more opportunity to get in and become partial owners than there is in most sports. And to your point about the the like sponsorship stuff we were talking about, those are, you know, those are all interesting ways that these guys could actually. I don't think that they should be making decisions. You know, like I don't think they're, you know, like I would not think of Jackie Stewart as like a guy who runs an entire Formula One team. Yes, he was a great driver, and he's pretty entertaining. But like, it's even like Lawrence Stroll. Like, I wouldn't think of Lawrence Stroll being somebody who's really making, calling the shots, so to speak, of the Formula One team. It's a different beast running a team like that compared to running a, you know, massive corporation like Aston Martin. But to me, Alonso has, like, if I if I'm not talking about driver ability. I still think he's top five, top 10 driver ability, but like as far as just pure passion and fan of the sport and yeah. brings a fandom with him, he's yeah. absolutely top yeah. three. I think he's I probably think actually second behind the, Lewis the, and, you know, the, the diehard fans that are going to follow him wherever he goes, which makes him like a, you know, a minority owner of what, like it totally makes sense for him to start negotiating that. The reason why I brought it up is because we're talking about all this stuff with Aston Martin and like, what are they going to do next? If Stroll, if, if Lawrence is not going to sell the team, which doesn't sound like he would do that um, after investing all that money, it just seems like you, you, you've just made like a really expensive paperweight if you don't prove that it can win. And Alonzo could be a, a person that could actually benefit that team, whether he's in the car or not going forward where Lance doesn't quite, do much for any you know for for me at least not no offense but i i think daddy stroll his goal now is to have the star driver have lance drive win a constructors on and then say like oh my my son was like a world champion constructors driver that that's the best he can hope for now but see, that's the irony of all situations because he could have Max Verstappen in his prime, but I could still see Lance bungle it somehow and he doesn't get that constructor's title. <laughs> he, he takes out Max at, at yeah. 
Like, let me give Max a high five on his way to the chair. Oh no! <laughs> yeah. No, he's not. He's not Logan Sargent bad, but um, yeah i I can't wait until the race this weekend. Hopefully, more clarity on all these rumors come out. Do we want to but do predictions on the race? Max wins by 20 seconds. Actually, historically, Mercedes has run pretty well at this track. Yep. And they've been going pretty well lately. The one thing I don't think Mercedes can compete on is that final really long left into the straight. And they yep. just don't have the top speed. They don't have the top speed to compete with Red Bull. So I think it's close-ish. 10, 15 seconds. Max wins. Lewis P2. Uh, I'll say Lando P3 so he can do his weird P3 thing again. <laughs> the German three, as seen in Glorious Bastards. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Uh, Nick, who you got? I mean, I probably agree with Todd, but just for sake of wishful thinking, I'm going to I'm gonna say Lando's going to win. Max is going to f- have some sort of issue and finish middle of the field somewhere and or or be out. And Lewis comes in second. I'm going to try to do a non-Max thing because we all know Max is going to win it. I'll go Lewis, Max, Carlos in that order. Carlos, huh? All right. Because he's the better driver. (laughs) (laughs) We will see. All right, guys. Well, we we got anything else? Any parting, parting thoughts? Oh, yes, yes. Live unboxing. Live unboxing. So the listeners may or may not know this. One of us has had a birthday at the time of recording. And another Mm -hmm. one of us has decided when it is your birthday, you should receive a (laughs) gift or two. So we went ahead and bought the aforementioned Todd Yates, who's celebrating his 21st birthday for the 10th time. 20th time? Oh, sure. Yes. So, yeah, we got Todd a gift, but because, uh, unfortunately, Amazon does not use DHL because, you know, that's the type of synergy we would want at the exhaust notes. He is going to get his present a day late, and he has told us that he will wait for the actual unboxing of said presents for the next episode. So if you need a tease, there it there it is. You will find out, along with Todd, what exactly we got him for his birthday. And Nick, it notes what... I was just going to say, it's something mustache related. So leave your comments in the Discord. I don't know what the hell it is. Nick, do you want to give a cryptic clue since you are? Uh, well, we, it, it actually may or may not have something to do with. Uh, wow. Actually, one of the things is about someone who was not mentioned on this episode. And the other is and someone other? who Todd. Heavily mentioned. Either loves or loves to no, hate. We'll just say somebody was heavily. No, see that might have given it away. I was just gonna say there was somebody that was barely mentioned on this episode, and then there's somebody that was heavily mentioned on that episode, and that's all we're gonna say. All right, we shall we shall It'll be see. Fun. All right, let uh, folks know where you can they can find you outside of the show, and you guys need to start using threads. Let's let's just. Give it a shot. We don't need to be supporting the demise of Twitter any more than we already have. X, yeah, sorry. X. Well, <laughs> I refuse to call it X. Uh, as as soon as F one journalism information makes its way into threads and the algorithm isn't broken, I will happily see you there. <laughs> but where can they see you now, Todd? Uh, you can see me on Twitter, Datshu underscore JPEG, JPG, uh, or Instagram, uh, Datshu dot JPEG, Shu being S H U E. Shout out, Michael Schumacher. Perfect. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Rohizi and Instagram at Rodem13 and on Christian Mingle as the Big Bad Booty Daddy42. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even follow that up. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. Oh so man! Switched I hope... off of OnlyFans, and now we're on Christian <laughs> <Yeah>. Angle. <laughs> yep, reinventing yourself. 
All right, well, you can find me at Nick Engvall on all the platforms. More importantly, follow Exhaust Notes FM on all the platforms and uh, hit the first link wherever you're watching or listening to this to join the community, hop in the Discord, uh, have some great conversations with us between the races, and we will catch you on the next episode. Make sure you hit that subscribe, too. Thanks. Peace. Peace.